The Y Factor is proudly brought to you by Flames Steakhouse Pizza and Ribs in Campsie, the best steak you'll ever have. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of The Y Factor. Today is Thursday, March the 15th and we are here for another episode of The Y Factor. You've got Tasneem here on the mic and I'm joined by the guest host Yusra. Welcome Yusra. Hi Tasneem, how's it going? Alhamdulillah. Now Yusra, we've kept on because uh, unfortunately none of you guys decided to vote her off. So unless um, anyone on The Y Factor starts a campaign to get Yusra off, I guess we're just going to get her to keep co-hosting, hey? Exactly. All right. Now this week, inshallah, we have a very, very exciting episode ahead of us we uh, go down and investigate um, a very very serious issue and that is the issue of the detention center especially Bulawood the plight of the asylum seekers and what we can do as a community to help a lot to be said there we have very three very credible um, and incredible actually um, uh, interviews coming up uh, so stay tuned for that but just before we go and do that quickly for the news for this week so Yusra what's happening in, around the world our first news item this week is Afghanistan in regards to the soldier who actually went on a killing rampage and killed 16 civilians, uh, which included women and children. Now, Barack Obama has come out to say that the US takes this as seriously as if it was our own citizens or our own children who were murdered. We're heartbroken over the loss of innocent life, Obama said. This this is about the weekend incident. And uh, he added that uh, anyone who was involved in the attacks will be fully accountable. Uh, This comes as uh, the first deadly violence linked to the aftermath of the killings, and although there was no claim of responsibility, the Taliban actually vowed to avenge the U.S. gunman's attack. Now, this comes as a poll in America reveals that uh, most Americans do believe that the war was not worth the cost and do want an early withdrawal. All right. Yusra, I find the most interesting thing in this article is no one ever mentioned the fact that this guy is a terrorist or his actions were terrorising. Okay? We didn't hear the word not, not once. Not just that, but the media gave him a very good 10, 20 minutes of contextualization. The guy was an alcoholic. Um, you know, he had issues and this is why he, he did what he did, right? I just hate the fact that you never, ever hear the word terrorist um, in the media. If they're not Muslim. With, exactly, with someone other than... Uh, yeah. And it's just absolutely ridiculous. Now, in local news, what's happening on the local scene? Well, our new Foreign Affairs Minister, Bob Carr, said that Australia should stay open to nuclear technology despite Japan's recent disaster. Senator Carr said that the push towards nuclear energy was hampered by last year's tsunami and earthquake disaster in Japan, which caused the worst nuclear crisis since Chernobyl. 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 Japan has set it back because of the impact it's had on insurance and costs, he said today. However, he's still open to nuclear energy. And apparently he's advocating it as a believer, quote-unquote, of uh, climate change. And he reckons, um, you know, investing in these renewable resources, which includes nuclear resources, it's it's a way to go. Now, uh, I don't know. The Y Factor listeners, let us know your thoughts. I mean, I'm all for new, you know, renewable resources and, um, you know, things like this especially in the light of climate change. But with nuclear energy, I'm just very really, risky. really, yeah, very yeah. iffy about that topic. Um, in the global scene, uh, you know, all around the world, Syria, the situation is just not getting any better. Egypt, there has been a couple of unrests. Um, Burma, you know, the situation with their minorities, it's just going through the roof. So I think re- globally, we do have a couple of issues on our hands. Um, and I think, you know, Alison is out there. Just um, make sure you stay on top of things in the global sphere. Now, we thought just because we have a very serious episode coming up, we thought just to, um, this week we just will give you guys a couple of um, wacky new segments wacky new segments um, just to kind of break the ice before we do actually get on to our um, our serious news for this week so apparently um, you're not allowed to die somewhere I hear yes make sure that if you're ever planning to die make sure it doesn't take place in Fal- Falciano del Masico near Naples because there is no cemetery available due to a council boundary fre- feud and the council just said that it's just illegal to to die in this area. And kick the bucket. Yeah. Do they have any initiatives for what to do if people do die? Well, you can't, you can't lock up a... Uh, 
dead person, can you? I mean, the, what they do is, uh, uh, this is Naples, so I'm not sure that they actually do cremate bodies there. Um, but this is actually, even in Sydney, I mean, it's concerning. Rookwood's getting filled up really quickly too. So yeah. we do have to start looking at alternative There's been burials. talk of having uh, a double bunk bed. A double bunk cemetery, actually, there's been talk about recently. You just said bed. Well, you know. You're so not coming on the show next week. <laughs> All <laughs> right. <laughs> Apparently, globally, there are, um, you know, symmetries are not our only problem. Toilet paper is a problem too? Yes, it's in short supply. In New Jersey... A critical toilet paper shortage in New Jersey you could see dozens of public buildings closed for health reasons. Now, the dispensers are actually going to be empty in a number of police and fire departments, museums and senior citizen centres in its capital, Trenton. There was a dispute about the high price of hot drinks cups also supplied by the firm that provides a toilet paper, which saw the entire contract just Scrapped. tear up. And so, guys, make sure you carry around some portable... Um, some toilet. Kleenex, some Kleenex rolls. <laughs> if you're, if you're in Just New in Jersey. case you're in New Jersey and there's no toilet paper. Yes, take your sort of advice very seriously. <laughs> very seriously. Now, just to some heartening news, apparently, thanks to science, uh, the world's tallest man is actually going to stop growing at the age of 92, uh, sorry, 29. <laughs> he's not the oldest, he's the <laughs> tallest. Um, and he's Sultan Kosen from Turkey, who measures 2.51 metres. And he was listed in the 2011 uh, Genius World Records um, to actually be the tallest living man. Now, he visited the University of Virginia Medical Center in May 2010 for treatment for a disorder called acromegaly. Acromegaly, I'm hoping that's right, <laughs> which caused, um, which was caused by a tumor in the pituitary gland. Now, the Richmond Times reported that Kosen was placed on a new medication that could potentially help control the production of growth hormone and stop his continued growth. Um, and according to university officials, doctors in Turkey said Kosen had actually stopped growing so he stops there at 2.51 meters interesting well Tasnim, little people may actually save the world a leading philosopher says that making smaller less resource intensive humans via genetic engineering or hormone therapy has actually been proposed by new york's professor matthew liao who says that carbon pricing isn't enough that instead we should just make sure that the population keeps shrinking so that they can consume less resources how's that okay so it's not little people it's more of less people no, smaller people. Okay, yeah, but what are you going to do? Like genetic, genetically kill off all the big people and the tall people? Well, I wonder what Charles Darwin has to say about that. All right, well, we'll <laughs> leave it there, listeners. Uh, let us know your views on these wacky and weird stories on the Facebook page. Um, if you don't know what the Facebook page is, it's the Y Factor Radio Show 87.6 FM. We're more than happy the discussions have actually been pretty lively and um, exciting. And if you want a reason to procrastinate, why not get on the Y Factor page? As we said, stay tuned. Um, coming up next is a discussion of a very pertinent issue in relation to the asylum seekers um, and refugees in Villawood Detention Centre. You're listening to the Y Factor on 87.6 FM. The Y Factor. Ever been on the driving sign and you're riding, you're looking through the glass, see your car on the side. The engine's broken and the car is smoking and the dude is shaking cause the heat is baking. All this cat's got a flat and the spare's all whack. No jack in the back and no clue where he's at. There ain't no real rush but you will ride by, not even asking the guy if he needs a supply. He might be alright and to pass ain't a sin, but within you feel bad in the state that he's in. How hard would it be just to ask you okay? That might be the deed that you need to succeed. That might be the deed that will so please a lot that you're forgiven the sin and you did when you was living. A small little thing that can cling and just ring and will bring the blessing from Allah who's the king. We pass on them deeds cause they seem all small. But they might be the deeds that's the best of them all. Mad when I see all these passes I took on these small little deeds I just overlook. I just can't believe all these that I overlook. Can you see little deeds that I Welcome back from the break, guys. Joining me in the studio today is Marlene, who is a volunteer with the Advocates for Refugees uh, in Sydney, specifically in Villawood Detention Centre. Uh, Marlene is here to talk to us about the tragic reality um, of the detainees in Villawood Detention Centre. Welcome to the show, Marlene. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Wa alaikum assalam. Marlene, we've all heard uh, the terms asylum seekers, refugees, detention centre, mandatory detention, you know, suicides, unrest, protests. Ter various terms are um, being thrown around. Mm. 
as a volunteer that has been attending the detention centre regularly, um, can you just let our audience know a bit about the reality and what's ha- actually happening at Villawood Detention Centre? Okay, so I went into Villawood, um, I've been going into Villawood now for a couple of months and initially I went in with some uh, friends of mine from Socialist Alliance um, who are advocates and activists for refugees and I've been engaged with them in some activist movements in the past so I was happy to go along with them and um, I was quite shocked actually to encounter so many Muslims, so many Mohammeds in there, so many brothers and sisters who are a kind of, well they feel like they've been forgotten. Um, I remember the first time I went there, I met uh, one brother who had slash marks all over his arms. And I said, brother, what happened to you? And uh, he was kind of embarrassed. And he said, look, you know, I was really desperate and I was in so much emotional pain and I just, you know, I harmed myself. And he was quite embarrassed. But anyway, we've become good friends and he's shared a lot of his life with me. His struggles in Sri Lanka and introduced me to many other brothers and uh, friends who are obviously not all of them are Muslims. But I've, I've managed to meet and, and listen to so many stories uh, in relation to their journey to Australia, prior coming to Australia, the struggles in Sri Lanka, in Burma, uh, and uh, many of them have been tortured in ways that um, we really don't have an understanding. You know, we think of refugees as people that are queue jumpers, you know, people that come here on boats, they've got money, they're rich, whatever, whatever the media tells us. Um, and we, in, in listening to the primary stakeholders, you know, the people themselves, and it's not only listening, you can see the marks on their bodies, you can see where they've been stabbed. I, m- I met a young, a young boy, um, he, he really affected me, I couldn't stop thinking about him when I met him. I saw him as my son, I saw him as, as my brother and my child, because he's like 24, and he was tortured probably when he was about 17. He was in a bomb blast, he's got shrapnel in his head, he was stabbed in the back, he was tortured. He had his feet smashed. He can't move his fingers because they were also smashed. And um, he has been rejected um, as a refugee because the uh, lawyer made a mistake and the interpreter made a mistake. So wow. I, I, I was really, really upset. And I, I, I sort of became quite desperate because I thought, you know, Allah has led me here and I have a responsibility so I inquired with the other people that were visiting and we suggested for him to sack his lawyer and get another one. And um, as I got to know him more and more, um, I found out that this young man has um, tried to kill himself a few times, not because he hates life, but because he can't get, he can't, he's not able to get the images of people dying around him, little, girl, little girls being raped next to him. Um, he saw a woman uh, that who had been disemboweled and had a baby attached to the umbilical cord dead next to him. He was forced to drink water at, w- amongst decomposing bodies. You know, these things are really horrific. And to me, I find it very, very um, appalling to think that we have a system that abandons these people. And furthermore, that we as Muslims really don't um, consider that these people exist and yet they're in our backyard. That's right. And Villawood Detention Centre, I mean, I, when I was driving there on Sunday, is literally two minutes from Chester Hill Station. Yeah. And I was just, seriously, and you, when you drive up, you're like, Does this, is this Australia? Now, with um, the refugees, the ones that you have been in yes. contact with, what backgrounds are there? I know um, we saw Sri Lankan, Burmese, yes. Afghan, uh, Iraqi, Irani, Chinese. Egyptian, Chinese, yeah. Algerian. Yeah. So a, very, a, a wide range of cultures, as you said, Muslim and non-Muslim. Yes. Um, so with these people... <laughs> I, don't, I just listened to the story. I just feel like, wow. So you decided to take matters in your own hands um, and that's how it basically started. So what did you end up doing? Well, um, I initially, um, you know, when I went in there, I always take food with me wherever I go. Um, being a wog, you know, <laughs> we, we, we have that ability to be generous and hospitable and Muslims are known for that. So I thought, gee whiz, you know, we should... I asked them, I said, look, what do you need? And they were reluctant to tell me because they were embarrassed, I think. They didn't want to ask. They're, they're people that are humble people. They have a certain amount of pride left in them still, you know. But they said, oh, sister, you know, if you can bring me some garlic, it would be really nice, you know. <laughs> or if you can bring me some curry powder. And I was like, I can do that. You know, of course I can do that. And, um, you know, and we really... We, we feel like we've been forgotten. So can you please get other people to come and visit us, you know, regularly? And so these have been... The sentiments that have been reiterated by yes over and over again it's and if you think about you know the thing that the way that i saw it was that if you know the muslims we all talk about brother or sister we have this lip service towards each other and relating to our brother and sister but 
if you were really going to see your brother in Villawood, what would you take him? How would you treat him and how often would you go and see him? Would you see him just whenever you felt like it? No, you'd go every week and you'd make sure that you met his needs. You'd ask him, what do you need? You know, do you need shoes? Do you need glasses? And slowly they have come, I think, to trust me and to be able to open up and say to me, look, you know, I, one of them actually, I felt really sad for him. He's an, an Afghani, uh, another young man. He said to me, sister, you know what I need? I said, can you bring me? He said, can you bring me some super glue? And my glasses are broken. Mm. So, you know, we, we, took in, we took in some glasses, you know. And I mean, these are simple things that we can do. So I started asking my girlfriends, give me your husband's old glasses. Most people have two or three pairs of glasses. That's right. Um, you know, clothing, shoes, wh- whatever they need. But also, it's beyond that. I um, have taken uh, some cases or some, ca- um, some names to my local politician. And I have asked him to find out why these people are still in detention as an as, advocate as an on Australian, behalf, yeah, yeah. as an Australian, as a as a person who uh, has rights in this country, I have the right to ask my local member as to why these people are there. And specifically ones like the young man who's been tortured, who d- can't walk very well, he has fits, he shouldn't be in detention, he should be in the community. And furthermore, his brother's been released, so why is he still in there? It seems to me that people who have been tortured are treated like criminals because maybe they're terrorists, you know, maybe they're Tamil Tigers, maybe they're this, maybe they're that. And so it gets... The system has proven to... Um, become somewhat of a no man land there's 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 an area uh, with ASIO when people's cases are rejected you know there's nowhere to go and there are people in there there's Burmese uh, men that I have spoken to who are from the Rohingya community uh, they are stateless and their cases have been rejected and they have been in there for 33 months 16 months ago ASIO rejected the case and there's nothing to hear about what's going on so they are limited in their power but we are not we have the right to ask we have the right to lobby we have the right to communicate with politicians, write letters. These are simple things that we can do uh, as Muslims, as uh, humans, as people in the community, and we can exercise these rights. The other thing is to support them. I know that uh, the young man who was tortured, the Sri Lankan who um, has got shrapnel in his head, who suffers in pain every day, he tends to get very, very nervous. He has a lot of flashbacks. He's got a lot of problems, mental health and and physical in in every way, and uh, he needs to be supported. You know, we've offered him to go with him to the tribunals or to go and visit him before he goes to the tribunal so we can sort of support him. I've, I've suggested for him to show them his scars, show them where the military tore his arm open with barbed wire, you know, show show them where he's been stabbed in the back, show them his feet. I mean, how can you not see that he's been tortured? How can you ignore that he has these wounds and that he's so affected? I mean, there's people in there who have got limbs missing and they've been rejected because maybe, 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 just maybe they're terrorists, you know I mean? Uh, it, it seems that the notion of innocence you're proving guilty is reversing this Case. Case. It's, no. you know, you're a terrorist or you're guilty till you prove yourself innocent. Yeah. And even with bodily wounds, that's not enough. No. Show no, us no, even it's, more. It's not enough. Look, the human rights is really appalling. I think we talk about human rights, but it's it's something that's far-fetched. Well, Australia yeah. has not really honoured its... Um, it's, it's a six, international it's, obligations. The international obligations. And time exactly. and again, the Australian Human Rights Commission has actually come out with reports about the mm-hmm. horrendous conditions of Villawood Detention mm-hmm. Centre. Um, Serco hasn't really responded. I mean, even if you, you know, as you go to visit now, you can see major upgrades and their, you know, their PR policy says, you know, these are to respond to the, you know, grievous, um, you know, the complaints and the mm. suggestions of the Australian Human Rights Commission. But it's all, it seems it's lip service. You go in, you speak to these people, you know, like even so- something as simple as the food you were talking about. I mean, the food that they're served, it's, they're not used to this type of food, you know, no. very bland. It's not, it's not, you know, like ethnic, it's not appealing to them. Um, and, you know, things like, you know, desserts or chocolate are seen as luxury. I yeah. mean, this sounds like prison to me it doesn't sound like well it is a prison it's, it's it's not a holiday camp it's a prison you know they have limited um services available to them and even they feel that the services have been provided to them are not of the best quality you know they've sort of said to me why don't you come and work here and be our our, our community worker or <laughs> social worker and marlene and that's primarily through you basically speaking to them Absolutely. so bringing food and speaking now through speaking do you feel like um sometimes when you know if they get things off their chest um and Absolutely. they they can relate to you on that personal level gives them a sense of empowerment, a sense of relief? Well, look, I think that these people know that I care for them. They know that I'm advocating for them. They know that I'm rallying the community because I bring in different people. We invite different people. And I've made a commitment to go every Sunday. So different people come every week. Um, people don't need to make a commitment to come in every week, but, you know, the, the more often the better. Um, but I think as a community, as a Muslim community, we have the capacity to actually be very generous. We're a great community, and I think that we could make such a difference if we made a commitment. I can tell you another thing, like, 
like there's a little old man from um, from Afghanistan and he looks at me and he says, oh, sister, thank you for coming. And he says it like four or five times. And the other day he said to me, you know this plum? And he held the plum up and he said, I haven't eaten this for three or four years since he left Afghanistan. So mm. simple things like a plum can yeah. make a difference. And maybe we don't think that a plum can make a difference, but a plum can make a difference. And Marlene, with the people that can visit, um, it's from all walks of life, you yes. know? So you don't have to, for example, I think some people feel like unless, you know, they're social workers or mental health mm-hmm. advocates or lawyers or immig- migration agents, they can't provide their services. You don't need to be that. No. All you need to do is be a human being. And just especially um, sometimes the men, they yeah. underestimate this is kind of seen as like a women dominated field, you know, going in and trying to help and things. But these are, you know, um, you know, men with the youngest, I think we met is probably in their 20s, but they, they go up to 40, 50 years old. That's right. And it would actually be really nice for some of our brothers just to yes. get in there and just sit and have a conversation right. with these guys, you yep. know. You sit and have, you know, like coffee and lounge around oh, in Lakemba. Oh, look, they are they are so um, hospitable, you know, with whatever they can. Like when I take food, they take they take charge of that. They put out the food. They bring out the plates. You know, they feel like they've got some ownership over something. They make you great coffee in the microwave. You know, some of the Afghanis make fantastic, you know, milk coffees and, um, you know, they they, they really f- they do make whatever do they with can. With what resources they've got, they do, and they're very respectful. Like I yeah. had somebody mention to me, "Oh, you shouldn't be going in there because you're a sister," but I can say that in the time that I've gone in there, no one has been disrespectful to me. No one has been... um you know, rude or inappropriate. I think in the contrast, they've been humble, they've been respectful. And the difference that you can make is very significant. I was with a Burmese brother and he was crying. He's a grown man and he was crying because he's been in there for 32 months and he hasn't seen his family and his father's sick and he can't work and he can't support them. And if we reflect on how it would be for us to be like that as men, then think about how they would feel. And yet, you know, they don't have anyone visiting them. They don't know many people. Sorry, there are people visiting, but generally they're Anglo. They're they're caring people who do regularly come in. Um, But this particular brother... um, you know, I said to him, I'm going to come and see you, you know, I'm going to come and I'm going to make sure that I see you all the time and tell me what you need. And I can tell you that since I've been going to visit him, it has made such an impact and such a difference, you know, and and you can see it in them. You can see the change. The other thing is that there's so many people in there with disability, you know. Disability is, is you see them walking around, they've got the depression, they've got the physical, the torture, the trauma, all these things are regarded as disability. I think... um, you know, we really need to think about ourselves and think about, you know, where our hearts are, you know, as Muslims. And now that I have told you all about it, there's no excuse. You will all be judged. Allah will record everything. Allah is the one. I, I really, I do. I get scared. I think, gee, have I done enough, you know? So I have been fortunate. The brothers at the markets, at Flemington Markets, they give out, they give me free fruit. They bring in free fruit. They come in, they visit. You know, it's, it, like I said, the community is generous. But we can always do more. And we can always, 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 you know, dig in deeper and, and really give out from our heart. And what's your advice to young people out there, um, basically, you know, lounging around on their Sundays or their weekends or things like that? Ah, uh, look, I think um, I I really enjoy going into Villa Ward. I I a lot of the times I do feel drained, but I think it's it's very rewarding. And I think, you know, Islam is um, always tells us to be charitable. And Allah, in his wisdom, he understands why he he dictates that to us in so many of our surahs because charity opens up opens us up to so many good things and we open up ourselves to the hasanat from Allah I mean how much how much better can it get you know, and not that just that you think you're providing them a service you're the one that leaves and you feel empowered you feel like you you've do. done something you honestly feel like your life is worth you're it now yeah. that's yeah. right yeah. look there's more that we can do I think that we can develop this um, as far as now there's, there are some people that have been released and you know we need to be looking for work we need to be supporting them as brothers and sisters you know if my brother was getting out I'd be looking for work for him I'd be looking for somewhere for him to stay. So many of our Muslim brothers and sisters have got spaces in their homes. They've got granny flats, you know. These people's lives are very, very traumatised and damaged. They've lost families. There's one brother from Sri Lanka who saw, you know, 50 members of his family being killed. He lost thousands of his friends from university because they belonged to a union. He was tortured for 18 months. His brother's affected with a disability because the Sri Lankan army stomped on his head so many times that now he's disabled. So, you know... We can do more. I think we, we can always do more. And I think we, we really have to think about what kind of an ummah are we? You know, how how are we going to react when the calling is there? All right, Marlene, thank you so much. Honestly, words of empowerment um, to our audience out there. Stay tuned. We do have two more interviews coming up um, and they do give alternative, um, you know, 
avenues for to actually for you to actually become involved um, and empowered through this project and to help these detainees. Marlene, thank you very much once again. Thanks so much. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. The Y Factor. It says, small things that are over. I just can't believe. Small things that are overlooked. Can you see? Little things that are overlooked. And you read, read about it in my holy book. It says, small things that are overlooked. Picking up trash on the path in the flash Taking glass from the grass as you pass to your class A smile goes a mile and it sure is worthwhile When a brother's hostile and has been for a while Put a dollar every day in the sadaka It may be small but you do it for the baraka I know you save it for your polo and your nautica A poor student but you do it just to please a lot Things like praying for an ailing brother Under the weather Obeying yo, your lovely mother is for the better Stay and help your baby brother Put on a sweater Even staying good to one another When you're together Advice to another sister about a mister Your wife always go and kiss her Tell her you miss her At night do a quiet picker And pray the with her Invite a guy who wants to pick her To share a sneaker Grand plans expand in our small little hands But we overlook demands that you see my strands We get jammed on exams When we skip the small things Small baby keys Come on, bring the blessings Small things that I overlook Can you see little things that I overlook Welcome back from the break, guys. Joining me in the studio today and ready to kick off our segment about uh, the detainees at Villawood Detention Centre is Maha Najarin. Maha is an executive with Mission of Hope. She is also involved with the social justice projects um, with Jan. She is also the former Villawood Detention Centre Outreach Coordinator. Welcome to the show, Maha. Thank you for having me. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum So, Maha, what is Villawood? I mean, what's this fuss? What's, what's detention? Tell us. <laughs> Fair enough question. Basically, Villawood... Willowood Immigrant Immigration Detention Centre is probably one of the oldest in Australia. So it opened up in 1976 and its main purpose was to accommodate overstayers, people who have breached their visas, people who don't have a valid visa or people who have been taken from international airports for further investigation or further questioning about their stay in Australia. So it's, it's a place primarily not for boat people as such. It's more for people who have breached their current visas or don't have an existing one, those sorts of things. <coughs> yep, keep going. Yeah, so, so basically that's what Villa Detention Centre is. It's a place where people will stay um, and wait until either their bridging visas or a, a other form of visa is looked at by the minister. Okay. So th- their matter is still being looked pending. at. Pending, that's it, right. It, exactly. It's pending, is yep. pending, So what's mandatory detention? Mandatory detention is basically if you've breached your visa or they've got sus- suspicious grounds or anything like that, then you are placed at the immigration detention centre. And you're not allowed to leave. And you're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to... Um, and you're not allowed to be in the community, basically. You're not allowed to live at live with your family, live with friends, work, those sorts of things. So you're basically in detention. You're basically in prison. It's it's another form of incarceration, really. Who are the actual people living in uh, Villawood Detention Centre at the moment? Is it mainly families, single men? It's it's a mixture, and the reason for that is because Villawood Detention Centre has got undergone a lot of renovations. And so previously, you would have families, and then you know the law, the changes to the legislation kicked in, so no children were allowed to be kept at detention centres and so it was mainly men and single women or couples Um, and nowadays you see more men at the main building so you see men with um, men some partners those sorts of things and you've also got families in the community detention centre housing so there's this new complex and it's it's more it's more friendlier it's more inverted commas <laughs> yeah it's more friendlier and it's a place where i've actually seen kids there as well so it, it does look like you know duplex properties and and you know a, two or three couples stay in one home. So that's how it looks like at the moment. Okay. So with Villawood Detention Centre, it sounds so nice and rosy from what you've described, but obviously we know the reality fans. is vastly different, okay? It's obviously not as rosy as that. That's right. Like a, a, a few, last week, a bunch of us actually went down to Villawood Detention yep. Centre, just going, entering the complex with the dirt roads, the, you know, barbed wire, the fences. You yep. honestly think it's a military base in Afghanistan or yeah. Iraq or something? It, it is a bit intimidating. Definitely. When you enter, they make you put tags, they write on you with invisible yep. ink. Yeah. Um, you have to know someone in there. You get in there, yeah. and it's just—it's very shocking and intimidating for a first. It visit. actually used to be a lot worse. 
So a lot, a lot worse. And I don't think I can stress that enough. So prior to having all these um, renovations take place, you know, the visiting area was really, really shocking. The visiting area was really bad. And in terms of the security, it actually used to be a lot more tougher than it is now. So before, not only would you have to get go through the metal detectors, but they'll actually pat you down and check your feet and check your shoes and those sorts of things, which is not something that happens now. Wow. Um, okay, so I appreciate my next visit. <laughs> but when we actually entered... The uh, the detention centre, the morale, the people there, they, they were, to put it in a nice way, were yeah. very, very, in, very ba- in a very bad state, of right? Of course, and anyone would be if you're incarcerated. Okay, so can you tell <laughs> us, um, so Mission of Hope um, started this program, so it's yeah. called the um, Villawood Detention Centre Outreach yeah. Program. So what's this program about exactly? Well, basically in 2008, we were contacted by the Community Projects Coordinator of Villawood Detention Centre. So they basically work for the Department of Immigration and they contacted us because they were very concerned about the lack of involvement of Muslim detainees with mainstream projects or programs at Villawood. And so they've noticed that they're also getting a lot more depressed, a lot more anxious, you know, sleeping for most of the day, waking up at night, not doing much, not participating. And so that really kind of does affect their application to remain in Australia. So this is when they contacted us and they said, what can you do? um, We've been told that Mission of Hope is all about community health, community, sorry, community development and health. So how can you um, contribute towards the Muslim detainees at Villawood? And so this is where we came with an idea of, okay, um, it sounds like they need some social support, they need to develop friendships, they need to have some sort of um, interaction with the outside world. And this is where we started developing weekly weekly visits. At first, it was a lot more formalised. So we would get clearance from the Australian Federal Police. We all had to do criminal checks. We all had to undergo training. And we were actually allowed to go inside the premises. So that was very unusual. And we were actually the first Muslim organisation to be allowed to do that. Wow. So it was it was really good. And the sorts of things we carried out were educational programs. So we did have English classes. We even had, you know, a, a science teacher run science classes <laughs> nice. and those sorts of things. So it was really good. And we had, you know, we had a, a lot of aims and objectives and we wanted to fulfill them. But we noticed then that the 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 needs of the detainees started to change. You know, that and that could be because they wanted to get out. Mm. You know, even though it's great that we're offering how to apply for jobs and how mm. to find accommodation. When do we actually put exactly. this into mm. practice? When can we put this into practice? So it kind of um, s- didn't continue mm. at that point. And it turned out to be more social and emotional support. And I think that's that was really, really appreciated by the detainees and something that they wanted to continue. And this yeah. is where the project is at, at the moment, providing more of emotional and mental support to the detainees? Definitely. And just relationships, relationships with the outside, friendships with the outside world, yep. sorry. Now, just with the, to go back to your original point, so when the department approached you to get the level of engagement up, did it actually work? So through, did it, they start it, engaging? It really, really did. Oh, wow. And even the community projects coordinator at the time would contact us and say, they're, they're like new people. Wow. You know, they, they look forward to our weekly mm. visits. And throughout the week, they're a lot more relaxed, a lot more energetic, a lot more hopeful, and really look forward to the next visit. That's so cool. so yeah. they've got something to look forward to. Definitely. And so it's we really can't um, underestimate, under, the exactly, underestimate the importance of, of social interaction, of developing friends, of, because we are social beings after all. So detainees are no different. They're actually probably in need of more social support than anyone else. Because they're, they're, they're basically isolated. Like, <laughs> and you can't actually go out there form connections, form networks, yeah. um, We, you know, it's it's basically crippling yeah. Um, yeah. in that sense. So, okay, so the... But, but if you think about why they're there to begin with, it's because they wanted to create a better life for That's themselves. Right. That's right. Create a better life for themselves and their family and also an opportunity to work here, you know, raise some funds to, to give back overseas. So what It's the biggest anticlimax. Yeah. They it come is, here yeah. with all these expectations. It is. It is. Yeah. And they're just locked up. And if you, you really could say that it's worse than being in prison because when, you, when you're in prison, you know when you're going to be released. You know when, you're, when your parole date is and due. And you know so you what? You've 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 pr- you've that's what I was going to say. Exactly. Yeah. A seeking asylum is not a crime under international law, okay? Although we'd like to think, you know, illegal, you know, queue jumpers, boat people, it's yeah. not illegal to seek no, asylum. And I'm pretty sure if something happened to Australia, yeah. like by the shuttle, you know, <laughs> may never happen, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're going to be jumping onto to New Zealand Indonesia, or Indonesia yeah. and yeah. Uh, what, what prevents yeah. us from doing 
doing that. Yeah. It's important yep. on that note that the community realises that less than 2% of Australia's immigration is are, are boat people. So a majority of the a majority of people on immigration status or visas or whatever they may be are not boat people. So this this assumption that they're taking over and That's they're right. stealing all the jobs and That's they're right. taking all their housing opportunities is is all a load of Crap. bull. And social <laughs> um, social research has actually shown the majority of visa overstays are not those from no, the Middle Eastern countries. Not. It's actually UK and the US. Yep. It's, and it's the it's the white people that you see in Queensland who are <laughs> who, who who are waitresses <laughs> and you know they've got these weird accents and you ask them well how are you here? Why yeah. are you here? Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, we're just visiting. I'm just, you know, exploring on a tourist visa. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Is. So um, you've moved on to, um, you know, mental and emotional, um, you know, bonds, friendships, yeah. and because that was the gap right there. Can you describe to us why? So obviously these uh, people are isolated. They've come from very, very traumatic, traumatic pasts, um, and even you know it continues to haunt them. So with um, mental and emotional support and services, what do you mean exactly? So you just go in, chat to them. To That's eat. pretty much it. That's pretty much it. So we do have um, several main activities. And so we not only do we go in and visit them regularly, um, we also have a monthly lunch program. We also carry out some minor assistance. So any funds that are donated towards to Mission of Hope for Villawood Detention Centre, if one of the detainees needs shoes or clothes or a TV in their room or whatever that may be, we will buy that for them. You know, of course we would not recklessly spend this money because we understand that it's it, it's money from the community trust, and they yeah. and, and we, they trust us yep. to use that wisely. And in Chalayora we do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so these are the sorts of things that we do. So we do minor assistance. We we do um, a monthly lunch program, we do regular visits, and we also carry a, a, a Ramadan iftar program. So previously, members of the community would cook homemade meals and, and deliver them on a daily basis. Uh, unfortunately, that group who ha- used to be doing it are no longer able to. So Mission of Hope has taken that on board, and we're going to do that, inshallah, from now on. So we did that Every last day year. for Ramadan. Every That's day for awesome. Ramadan. Yep. And mashallah, the yeah, response was from the really community good. was just amazing. Overwhelming, yeah. I could not believe the generosity of our community. Right. They are truly, mashallah, generous people. Um, and basically what we did was we just created a roster. That's right. And we mm. said, okay, so every day of Ramadan, who wants to donate food? Who wants to either cook the food or, or give money to provide the food? Mm-hmm. And so there was about um, possibly around 100 and 110 detainees, fasting detainees at Villawood Detention Centre, mm-hmm. and they were in different stages. So Villawood is actually grouped and classed yep. into so, different stages. Yep. But Stage one, two, three, let's yep. not get into that because yep. it's a bit complicated. Yep. And so, you know, people from the community would donate $500 a day. They would donate, you know, say, hey, you know, please feed these detainees on my behalf. And, mm. and I actually spoke to some of the de- detainees about that, and they loved it because <laughs> no, there were two primary reasons. Number one is when they serve lunch at whatever time lunch yeah. is, too bad, get your food put it in your room yeah. and wait for iftar that's when you eat it so yeah. the food will get cold blah blah number two was the problem that a lot of this food is bland Anglo food and these it's people love it yeah they love their ethnic, yeah, like ethnic what I know yeah. the you know, chili yeah. the curries they love the that stuff so they actually yeah. Yeah, and you know what It's we laugh about it but honestly food is a very no, we definitely take it for granted yeah, yeah food is a very and even like last week when we went to visit they were just saying things can you bring chili powder right yeah like when you have to eat you know mash and uh, you know gravy and you know hot chips and oh, poor fella. I can uh, fillers. Imagine. I need chili on everything. <laughs> exactly. So um, I think even from an emotional perspective, just having homemade or ethnic food for yeah. them was a great morale. It's a co- and it's a connection to their homelands as well, Definitely. to their families who they're, who they're missing out on. Definitely. So um, that was very much appreciated by the And inshallah, this will happen again this year. Definitely. And details of the appeal will go up, yep, inshallah. Definitely. Okay. So yep. generally the way how we communicate with the community is through Facebook at the moment because it's such a popular means um, of, you know, social interaction that sort of thing so so really if anyone wants to get updated or wants to get involved then feel free to contact us there are there are people that you can contact as well so cow is the current coordinator of the Villa Detention Centre Outreach Program. So he primarily is is the key person, and he and he and his and his and his friends have such a good relationship with the current detainees in there. So he's a good contact, and I'm happy to provide his number. So if you can just call Brother Cal on zero four zero five nine four seven nine eight six, and he will be able to get in contact with you about 
how to visit, how to donate, how you can contribute, those sorts of things. And the, the Villawood, um, the Mission of Hope uh, page is actually called Villawood Detention Centre Monthly Halal Community Lunch. Yep, so that's that's the monthly program. What I will do is I'll link to the um, Y Factor Facebook page, you know, essentially as soon as you click onto it, you can have a look there. No um, so this is like a, a weekly, monthly visit. So as a yep. volunteer, you just c- uh, come in, um, you know, go in at the designated yep. time and go yep. in and see the detainees, chat to them, talk to them, eat with them. So, so the number does vary. Yep. So sometimes you'll have 10 brothers come out to the visitor section. Sometimes you'll have 40. So it really depends on the situation. It really depends on what other programs are running at the time, those sorts of things. Um, just quickly, other programs that we run as well is not only the Ramadan food um, iftar program, the regular visits, the monthly lunch program, but we also run the Eid gift drive. And basically we prioritise families that are in community detention um, in providing gifts for the children. So, you know, aid is is pretty gum for families in community detention. So we try to make it as enjoyable as possible by providing gifts and sweets and those sorts of things. Um, we also have Ramadan food packs. And so th- these food packs contain perishable goods. And we provide them to disadvantaged families. And we prioritise, again, communi- uh, families in community detention because of their lack of services and you know they don't get the full benefits and they are some they actually sometimes prefer to be back at Villawood because at least they're guaranteed some food on the table at the end of the day um, so that's a very important initiative as, as well and if you want to contribute or donate or anything like that please feel free to contact Cal or find us on Facebook or email email us at info at mission of hope it's all one word dot org dot au all right, Maha, as a volunteer and as someone who was the former project coordinator, what would your final um, message be to the young audience that are listening to you at the moment? Um, why should they get involved? I think it's been very important that we give back to the community in whatever way we can, um, particularly to people that are in very vulnerable situations like those at Villa Detention Centre. So if you can assist in any way, then why not? Why not get yourself out of your little world and your little bubble a couple of hours a week? A month and make, make somebody's day definitely definitely yeah. because the panel the the change that it can create is unbelievable it could possibly change someone's life especially in the context of the context of the really high suicide rates in the detention definitely detention. definitely you can really change people's lives here yeah by a small act a small date and so when you look at why people commit suicide you know yes of course keeping in mind that it's home all those sorts of things but a lot of the time it's because they've lost hope and they and they feel that they've got no one to turn to, and they feel that they there is no way out um, of this sort of struggle. So why not if you're if you're able to change and that? And it's not you know, it's not asking for something big. I mean, no. you know, time or just no, a social visit once a month, once not every three four months. Not at all. You know, a couple of hours. It's not you know financially or you know physically no, or no. mentally straining. You don't yeah. even have to contribute financially if you're not in a position to That's do right. that. Because That's you know, I know that with university students, you've got your We're own broke. bills to pay. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've got all these things yep. to um, consider. So it, why not That's just time? It's yep. time. Yeah. It's about. It's about forming genuine friendships and relationships with people and, you know, helping them. In so, guys, invest a couple of hours every week. Take those hours away from your Facebook schedule. Yes, and yes. Donate and the, the Y community. Factor page. I've seen how many people <laughs> comment yeah. on that. It gets ridiculous. <laughs> All right. Well, with that empowering message, we'll leave it there. Maha, thank you so much for coming once again. Inshallah, we will post a link to the um, Mission of Hope uh, group on the Y Factor page as well as the details of Cal whoever want, for whoever wants to pursue it. Maha, thank you so much for coming once again. Highly appreciate it. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum as Can you see little bees that I overlook? Can you read? Read about it in my holy book. It says small bees never overlook. Put a dollar every day in the sadaka. It may be small, but you do it for the baraka. I know you save it for your polo and your nautica. A poor student, but you do it just to please I Allah. I just can't believe small bees that I overlook. Can you see little bees that I overlook? The Y Factor. Welcome back on The Y Factor, guys. Joining me in the studio today is uh, the co founder of the Refugee Art Project. Safdar Ahmed, uh, who co-founded this project with Dr. Amit Tafigian, 
they ran uh, free arts classes at Villawood uh, Detention Centre in New South Wales, as well as Broadmeadows uh, in Detention Centre, which is in Victoria. Welcome to the show, Safta. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, Safta, la- a week ago, uh, a group of us went down to Villawood Detention Centre just to see, you know, s- speak to the refugees, uh, see how they're going, refugees and asylum seekers, I should say. Um, and we felt like, you know, the ambience of the place or what have you, um, it was a, a, b- a bit of a depressed mood. These people, um, you know, they've come very vast journeys, they've gone through a lot and they've ended up in our shores, okay? Um, and you feel like lots of them have very traumatic past and things like that. So you decided to, um, your way of contributing um, to better the lives of these people was through an arts project. So what was the catalyst? Um, I think I'd always wanted to go into uh, detention centres just to see what it was like. So curiosity led me to go at first, but I wanted to have something constructive to do, not just to go um, and hear people's stories and feel helpless about it. So we wanted to do something positive, so we decided to go in and to give art classes for asylum seekers and then to see um, if we could hold exhibitions after that once we got a lot of an amazing response and a lot of artworks coming in. And that was something really positive um, that we could focus on. And with the art classes, was it you actually taught them to use art to express their feelings or was it more they just watched you do art? Oh, enabling them enabling to express them. themselves through art, that's right. Because um, I've got a fine arts background. I studied fine arts after high school. So um, at first it was just going in and um, giving drawing lessons or watercolour painting classes for anyone who was interested. And very quickly we had a group of people who were really keen on making art. And um, I think it was a really important source of um, therapy and diversion for them. And did you feel like they like appreciated the, all the like all the more because it was a a different way of um, for them to express their emotions? Usually, I don't know. I felt that when we went to visit them, they had to repeat their story, and they probably repeated it. You know, they can pro- times. yeah, they can probably just play it. You know, um, but maybe through art, it's a different means of expression. And did you feel like it helped them get it off their chest, kind of like the experiences? And yeah, I think art, as well as other activities like music and gardening, whatever it is. I think it's really important for people in detention. Um, obviously, being in detention is not a holiday, and they're living under, situ- under a situation of constant anxiety and stress. And so the prevalence of mental illness in detention is, is extremely high. worrying. Yeah. Um, and in that context, I think art or other activities give them a point of immersion in mm. which they can temporarily forget their stresses. Um, and I think... Just to relax for a few hours in that context is really important. Um, And from that we developed, I think, uh, good friendships. Um, And so visitors are really crucial for people in detention. It's not simply art for fun. It really is um, a lifeline to the outside world to meet visitors and volunteers and to participate in those sorts of things. Especially given the fact that they've got such an uncertain future and that's what defines them. They don't know what's happening to them. So I think it's really important for them to have that outlet of expression. Definitely. Uh, did you have any personal anecdote that you can share with us um, with some of the detainees? Any memorable moments um, as you were involved in? I know the, probably the whole thing is memorable, but anything you want to share with our listeners? Yeah. Um, well, um, we've had some amazing um, experiences with people in detention. Um, And I think the way they cope with that environment is actually quite inspiring because uh, it's very hard to imagine what it would be like to be locked up for one or maybe two years or even more than that in a foreign country when you haven't committed any uh, crimes. And um, in that situation, um, the way they deal with their environment and the way they resist it in various ways is really fascinating and they do that through art so for instance we had an engineer from Iran um, who had no access to tools because detention is much like prison you're not allowed Mm. sharp objects or glass or anything like that and he just made things uh, from scrap pieces of metal that he found Um, he made his own homemade uh, paint brushes from plastic cutlery um, and the bristles of the brush were made from cat hair because wow. there's a cat that goes in and out of the centre. <laughs> <That's laughs> it is. And he made My these. Poor cat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, the cat wasn't harmed. He just took it <laughs> okay. from the very end <laughs> yeah. of the tail. Yep. <laughs> Apparently, the cat's still good friends All with right. him. All right. Let's hope so. <laughs> 
Um, and he got hold of an old DVD player and made an electric massage machine from that, which you can well. strap around your arm or leg and it vibrates at two levels. And I think that's um, symbolic of his attempt to... to to move to, on. To keep active yeah. and to um, conquer his environment, you know, to keep inventing, to keep making To keep things. active, especially yeah. in that environment. Yeah. And yeah. I think also an important thing is um, some of these people, for example, some of the ones we did meet do speak English because they've studied at school. A lot of, a lot of them don't and they struggle, but with art it's a universal language. Like you That's don't actually right. have to, you know, eloquently convey yourself in Shakespearean language uh, to yeah. get across your emotions. But, you know, a picture conveys a thousand words, as they say. And, you know, just through art, through that expression, I think um, it does bring down a lot of the barriers so um, they can still convey what's you know deep down in their heart to people through art which is I think really amazing. Certainly and of course art isn't just for professionals um, art is for everyone and most of the people who've been involved in our art classes have never um, drawn with a pencil or painted in their lives um, but once they start they realize they discover their that talent something in yeah. this yeah and some of them have just become uh, you know, absolute geniuses um, from from nothing, um, simply because they found something that they're good at, that they can uh, express themselves through. We also had another person who came into detention, and at the time he had no paints. So he started painting just with instant coffee powder mixed with um, warm water. Wow. And, um, and he developed this technique of, of coffee painting, and he taught that to someone else, and then that person became the master of the coffee style and that's another example i think of, of innovation how, of innovation yeah. exactly using food um as their materials for art making food art exactly is it is it do you have a picture of this on your website or yeah there's yep. quite a few examples of of coffee paintings yep. there's a whole gallery of coffee looks, paintings looks great actually yep. on our website um, i think also it's important because a lot of these people um do sometimes not a lot i'm generalizing some of them come from professional backgrounds so they actually used to being useful being a contribution to society and when yep. you lock them up for you know one guy was there for 32 months right 32 yeah. months they feel totally helpless so so, you know, helplessness, um, if you can channel it into innovation and, you know, empowerment, then... Certainly, yeah. And in fact, the guy I mentioned before, the Iranian, the engineer, he also made a Sydney Harbour Bridge uh, replica model out of spaghetti, straight spaghetti. <laughs> nice. Wow. Um, and he also made um, a flour from cheese that he'd cut out with instant noodles. All sounds stuck, delicious. <laughs> all stuck on a plastic plate. So food art was a really strong way i think for them to, to because available transform. and it's their everyday uh, ingredients and just about changing the perspective and putting it together into a work of art that's right transforming yeah. these materials yeah uh into something new something mm. fresh you know with their imagination and as a as a teacher um of the art project did you feel because you started off the interview by saying you felt a sense of helplessness when you first started mm. did you feel personally empowered when um you saw you know these people engaged these people's lives changed because i think a lot of the times when we see um, unfortunate situations, we kind of just get really depressed about it, but helpless. Nothing, yeah. So, did you feel that through this positive, um, you know, project, and yeah. it, it got to exhibition level, which is amazing? Did yeah. you personally feel empowered as the uh, as an instructor? Yeah, definitely. I think obviously individual citizens can't change a lot. Um, I wish I could change government policy on asylum seekers, but I can't. Uh, what I think ordinary people can do is volunteer and go into detention centres and it does make a world of difference for the people inside. And so you do feel like at least you can contribute something to their well-being, even if it is simply a few hours of, of art or music or just conversation. Um, that's better than leaving, in, leaving them in there with, with nothing. And I think the friendships that they make through visits and volunteers um, really is a lifeline for them to the outside world. Okay, speaking, kind of, yep, speaking yeah. of uh, visits and volunteers, so you've actually had first-hand experience as a volunteer yourself dealing with these, um, these detainees. What would your um, advice or, say, recommendation be to the young people out there that are listening to our show? What would you advise them to do if they are um, passionate about um, helping asylum seekers and detainees uh, in you know, detention centres? Oh, my advice is simply to get involved. Um, um, it's easy to visit Villawood. Um, we also, in our group, accept um, new people who want to visit with us. So if anyone wants to visit uh, with us, they're more than welcome to come along. Um, and um, 
from there you you meet people um, inside and things can grow from there. So I think it's just good to 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 get on your feet and to go into a detention centre and to see what it's like and to speak to people. Um, and certainly if anyone has particular interests, hobbies or skills that they can share with asylum seekers, um, then that's, 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 that's great. And that's very, very important. And for the, the uh, coin, point of contact for those who wish to uh, get involved in the art project specifically, um, is there a website they can visit or anything like that? Yeah, we've got a website. Our website is therefugeeartproject.com. Um, we've also got a Facebook page under the same name, The Refugee Art Project. So um, anyone can contact us through those avenues and we're more than uh, happy to facilitate um, new visitors if anyone's curious. So uh, Safta, just before we conclude, any final words that you'd like to say? Uh, I guess my final thought would be that activities for people in detention um, are really important because it gives them a feeling of agency and self-empowerment. Um, which the system unfortunately takes away from them. They're pretty much infantilized on every level, whether it's the medication that they need, the food that they want, might want to eat, uh, clothing, all of that's provided by Serco. Um, and just for them to have a feeling of self-empowerment, for them to feel like they have a voice um, is really important. And so activities and visits I think gives them that avenue which is which is crucial. Thank you very much Safta. Uh, to our audience out there I will repeat the website it's theartproject.com and they do have a Facebook page so if you're interested in pursuing this uh, field further um, do make sure that you do visit the website as well as the Facebook page. Once again thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. The Y Factor. Hey Jamil, where can you get the best steak and ribs? At Flames. Have they got any deals on? Yeah mate, specials on Thursdays, pizza and pastas, only 10 bucks. 10 bucks? Yeah, 10 bucks, 10, 10 bucks, 10, 10 bucks. And 20% off everything else. Only on Thursdays and Sundays. Where at? At, at Flames. 396 Beamish Street, Campsie. Be there. The Y Factor. All right, that brings us to the end of the episode for this week. Just but quickly before you, we let you guys go, um, we'll go through the events that are happening in uh, Sydney in the next couple of weeks just so that you're aware and on top of things. Um, first up we have um, UTSMS is having their Islamic Awareness Week early uh, in um, – Term one this semester one sorry I should term say. one we're not in um, high school this I know it's called Sharia what is it all about um inshallah they'll have it, be having a range of talks Monday Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday 1 30 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Monday is the existence of God by Imam Afrozali Tuesday is Q and A session by Sheikh Arif Shakir uh, Wednesday is Australia, a place for Sharia law by uh, Sheikh Haysan Farachi. Thursday is punishments under Sharia by Wisham Sharkawi. And Friday is the Friday sermon about the Prophet as a true leader, which is 1.15 to 2 p.m. Um, if you're interested, email info at utsms.org.au or visit their website, which is utsms.org.au. So that is the Islamic Awareness Week for UTSMS. The next event we have coming up is... Seven Steps to a Successful Prayer. That is a free event which will be held uh, this Saturday from 5.30pm to 8.30pm. It will um, include a uh, discussion about the wisdom of prayer and the presenters do include Bilal Danun, uh, Sheikh Mustafa al Majoub, Brother Wissam Krayem, Brother Muhammad Khaira and Brother Muhammad Zaud. All welcome. Free entry, no children under the age of nine. And the, for more information, email... J-U-L-I-E-H at unitygrammar.com.au That's right. So that was Seven Steps to a Successful Prayer. And if you actually uh, Facebook the event, seven the number, Seven Steps to a Successful Prayer, inshallah it will come up. All right. Next event is The Drops of Jew, um, which is an exposition of Imam Nawi's 40 Hadith by Sheikh Tawfiq Chowdhury. It will be on March the 31st uh, to... It's a two-day seminar, so March the 31st as well as April the 1st, um, 8.30 a.m. till 7 p.m. at the University of Western Sydney in Milpera to Bulacor Avenue. Um, it will go through a, a wide range of issues, um, including, um, you know, signs of a pure heart, what Qadr is about, how to give advice, making dua, um, the sciences of hadith, how to give Islamic talks, a, a wide range of issues. 
If you're interested, um, you can actually uh, visit the Al Kothar website. It's quite intense. It's seven thirty, eight thirty a.m. to seven p.m. So it's a quite it's, it's quite jam packed day. Exactly, quite full on. So if you're interested, visit Al Kothar A L K A U T H A R dot org, um, and you can just Facebook the event um, or you know Facebook Al Kothar, and that should come up. So that's a drops of dew. Uh, next up is the trivia night. We all love a trivia night. This will be hosted by funny man Khalid Khalaf Allah from Melbourne, and uh, it will be held at um, Asil. Al Asil. I'm thinking. I'm thinking Yasmin. Yeah, Al Asil in Greenacre. It will uh, include mezzes, and um, ten teams will be competing for the fabulous prizes. And this will be a fundraiser dinner for Mission of Hope. Cost is thirty five dollars for adults, thirty dollars for your students. Uh, for more information, contact Sarah on 0404 567082 or email info at missionofhope.org.au. There is more information on the web. Just look up Trivia Night on Facebook. That's right. Now, um, ISRA, the Islamic uh, Sciences and Research Academy, is having an advanced Islamic studies course. It's a 10-week course for both when, men and women, and it goes through a detailed introduction of the fundamental sciences of Islam. It goes through spirituality, theology, Qur'an science and Qur'an commentary, the character of the Prophet, 10 sample hadith, theological and legal interpretations of the Islamic Sharia, jurisprudence and the purpose behind their practice. Um, there are various times for men and women, and it will be at, uh, in Auburn uh, at the ISRA um, suite, which is one two eight to one three two South Parade, Auburn. It, it goes over ten weeks, and it does cost fifty dollars. If you're interested, you can uh, email info at isra isra dot or ring up nine six four nine nine zero four zero nine six four nine nine zero four zero. And finally. Project Voice is coming to town. Right. Okay. <laughs> if you don't want to hear useless dramatic voice and you actually want to hear some amazing spoken word poetry, be sure to attend the Project uh, Project Voice, um, which will be March 23rd, 2011, duh, um, mm-hmm. 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Um, at the LMA Hall, which is 71 Wanji Road, Lekemba. Um, it, inshallah, it will be at 6, uh, sorry, 7 p.m. Um, and to 9.30 p.m. That's right. And they also have a, a poetry workshop the day after which is Saturday the 24th of March. Um, if you're interested in this, um, you can actually just... Uh, they haven't released final details of contact persons, um, but if you go on Facebook and type in Project Voice is coming, coming to town, dot, 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 it will come up. So if you're interested <laughs> dot, dot, in that, that's Project Voice, um, which will be March the 23rd. Now, before you hear any uh, more of useless traumatic singing, I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, thank you so much for listening, guys. Be sure to get on the Y Factor page and comments. Uh, comments are all highly appreciated um, have a great night and we'll see we'll, you next week that's right and we'll see most of you at the Villawood Detention Centre hopefully alright yes thank you very much you're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM